So next we have Eva Maria Graf from Imperial College London, and she'll be talking about quantum classical correspondence in chaotic PT symmetric systems. The floor is yours, Hi. Eva. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation as well. And, you know, organizing this nice event, obviously, as everyone said, it's a shame we can't all be together in person, but, you know, we make the best, the most of it. Um, I've been promising you to talk about this chaotic PT symmetric systems. And in the abstract, for those who read it, I did sort of promise several systems, but in the end, um, such as the kick top. And in the end, most of this talk will be about the kick top. There are other systems, but I felt it's probably not quite feasible to introduce a lot of different systems in one talk, but I'm gonna point out to you what's sort of more general and what we're not sure about, about how general it is. Um, okay, so this is joint work also with my former PhD student, Steve, who's in industry now working with data science as one does, and my current PhD student, Joel Hall. Right, so, oops, I keep on forgetting that when I share this screen, these things behave differently from how I think they behave. Right, so about, I'm just still thinking of where to put this. So about quantum chaos, I just wanna give a very gentle introduction into that and I'm not telling you anything new here just to set the scene of what this is all about I mean as most of you probably know in classical physics chaos is sort of the norm and the the notion of chaos can be kind of hand wavily described as saying that while the same causes have the same effects similar causes can have very different effects and you know more mathematically as many of you are familiar with that's really referring to an exponential sensitivity to initial conditions so if you have two initial conditions in a system that are just a tiny bit different then over time their difference would grow exponentially in a chaotic system there are other um, definitions of chaos and there are other requirements but that's sort of the easiest to keep in mind of course in chaos you know, why classical physics is generally chaotic, in chaos, there is no such thing as, no, sorry, in quantum mechanics, there is no such thing as actual chaos in this dynamical sense. We know that quantum mechanics or quantum dynamics is unitary, which really translates in the idea that these differences between initial states actually, or the overlap of initial states, stay invariant over time. So there's no chaos in the same dynamical sense, but clearly there are cl classical systems that are chaotic that have quantum counterparts that will show some signatures of this chaos. And this sort of, as many of you know, is, is sort of on the foundation or the heart of the field of quantum chaos, um, which really in some ways is a foundational field. It's um, about, you know, this correspondence of quantum and classics and how chaos can come up in classical systems, even though we believe quantum description is the more fundamental description of the world. And it doesn't really have chaos in that sense. But it also has a lot of applications. And some of them actually we've seen examples of um, in previous talks. Um, so let me just give you um, complete one brush talk of different applications of quantum chaos. And some of them are a little bit surprising if you just think about what the question of the field is. So one example is actually an application of quantum chaos that I'd like to call that way in number theory. And of course, you know, random matrix theory is a field on its own and it doesn't really need quantum chaos, but still a lot of interest in random matrices came from the field of quantum chaos and the universality ideas of random matrix theory actually carry over in the statistics of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, for example, and into the zeros of other number theoretical zeta functions. And there's a deep connection to chaotic dynamics and well, quantum chaos and this number theory coming from that direction, which is perhaps a little bit unexpected. Another example from a completely different field is, you know, how quantum ergodicity, the idea that a typical quantum eigenfunction of a chaotic system would explore the whole phase space of that system or would be not localized on particular structures, but on most of the phase space. So that's one of the main ingredients of the thermalization idea in closed quantum systems, which again is sort of a foundational thing, but from a very different direction 
And another example are micro disc lasers, which really in some ways are just quantum billiards and where again, chaotic or non-chaotic motion can be used or, you know, this is really wave chaos, but it's very similar to quantum chaos, obviously. Mm, so let me give you a brief outline of what I want to talk about in the next, um, how much time? 20 minutes, probably 25. It's a lot to go through, but I know it's also already a bit later in the day in the sense of having had a number of talks. So it's pretty visual. I'm just going to show you a lot of pictures and you know, then draw some conclusions from it. That's the way I do math and physics. <laughs> So first I want to introduce you to the standard kick top as a sort of example of quantum chaos. And it really is a very useful example. It is in some ways too good an example because it's actually more faithful to a lot of these correspondences than most other typical systems. So if you just pick a random chaotic system, it would not have the same correspondences as nicely as the kick top. But anyway, it kind of can give you an idea of what, what this quantum classical correspondence looks like in chaotic systems or in mixed regular and chaotic systems. So I want to give a brief overview of this. So standard kick top, the unitary one. Then I want to introduce a PT symmetric model system of a kick top. So generalization of the unitary ones. Then I show you the classical dynamics of that, but only very briefly, just some examples of pictures again. And then I want to move on to some of the quantum features of that and see how they relate to the classical features. And that, there's where I'm also going to bring up a couple of other systems for comparison or for new ideas. So the last part, if I ever get to it, is that I'm also presenting to you some work in progress, because I know some of you have seen this talk before and the, you can kind of go to sleep now if you're not already asleep. <laughs> and then there is a couple of new slides and a couple of new results in the in the final bit. Right, so let's, I'm actually having some cheat sheet here on the side. This is why you see me looking back and forth. So let's look at the kick top, the standard kick top um, is given by this Hamiltonian here. So it's an angular momentum system where you have this Lx, Ly, Lz. Ly isn't actually in this particular realization. They, you can generalize that with having that in there as well. But Lx, Ly, and Lz would be SU2 operators, so standard angular momentum. And then you have a Hamiltonian of that type, which is linear here. But then there's a nonlinear term. So it's not actually an SU2 Hamiltonian, right? So it's in a higher enveloping algebra of that. So you have an LZ squared term here, but you only switch that on periodically. So it's only switched on on kicks. So it's always only on for an infinitely short amount of time. And the beauty of that is that if you want to write down the time evolution operator over one period, the Floquet operator, that that's theoretically extremely simple because because of that delta function, it factorizes. It just gives you the evolution of the system without this nonlinear term and then the kick itself, right? So this is nice for the theory. Um, experimentalists tend to prefer periodically driven systems, but we can learn a lot about periodic systems by looking into kick systems in theory. But also these kick systems can be implemented with a little bit of effort. For example, this one, the kick top has um, a good, 20 years after being sort of theoretically studied, finally been implemented in cold atoms in experiments. But, you know, still it would be nicer probably to look at periodically driven systems with a sine function or something, which of course we can do as well. But we stick to this simple example as it teaches us a lot about quantum classical correspondence in such systems. I do need to try to keep an eye on the time. So, yeah. Okay. Right. So the classical dynamics of that system is really just the dynamics given by this Hamiltonian without the hat. So this here is a rigid rotation around the axis P zero epsilon. And then this kick here will give you a torsion because that's sort of a rotation with around the z-axis with an angle which is LZ. So it's proportional to where you are on there. So this is sort of what you would get from the quantum system in a very hand wavy way in the semi-classical limit or a limit of large angular momentum expectation values if you neglect quantum fluctuations. 
Okay, so the classic, the free evolution is of course the same for the quantum and the classical because it's linear in the algebra, but then the kick is a torsion around the z-axis. And I show you here a picture of what happens after one period of that to um, a great si a circle here of this sphere. So we take this and we evolve every point once by this um, kick top map and this is the outcome. This is also what's called this asymmetry line of the system. If you're interested in dynamical system, you probably know about what these things are. But I wanted to flag this up because in this picture here, when you just look at what happens after one evolution, you don't actually necessarily see the chaos or something like that. So this here would already be chaotic, but you don't see it after one evolution. To see something like chaos, you need to look after for evolutions for longer times, okay? And the system is regular for small kicking strength and is chaotic for large kicking strength. And here I have some pictures which are maybe not more familiar. So this is all very well known. This is basically what's in um, the pictures in Harker's paper. I redid them and, you know, so that we can compare to our own pictures later. But so for different kicking strength here, we have the Poincaré section. So you look after one period and, you know, do that for many periods having started a number of initial points and or here a projection onto the canonical variables where you have a, you know, can see the whole thing, the whole surface of the sphere here as a flat face space. And you see that for small kicking strength, this is basically a regular motion. It's mainly dominated by this rotation around this axis. Here I have put this epsilon zero. So everything, the free motion is a rotation around the um, X axis. And then if you put the kicking strength on, you can really visually see the chaos happening here. This system is never going to be fully chaotic. They're tiny regular islands somewhere in this chaotic sea here. Okay, but it's almost chaotic. So what are the quantum signatures of chaos in such systems? So one thing you can look at is actually the Husimi functions of the eigenstates of the quantum evolution operator. So classically, you look at these phase space plots when you propagate initial points in time with your classical map and quantum mechanically, you can look at this time evolution operator and that has eigenstates, that's the so-called Floquet states, and they actually tend to localize on classical structures that are prominent structures. And here I just randomly selected one case for a regular case where you see, you know, just a ring of one of these Husimi functions of eigenfunctions, and that would correspond to one classical orbit, or one which sits in the chaotic regime, where you kind of see that the quantum eigenstate, the Husimi function of it, is basically all over the place. It looks a bit like a random vector distributed all over the classical phase space, which would correspond to this picture here. So this here doesn't directly correspond to this. You can see that this here has been tilted, it's slightly different parameter set, but still this here would correspond to the classical regular motion and the chaotic one corresponds to Husimi functions of that type. Another typical thing to look at are eigenvalue statistics and they're the big thing in quantum chaos to look at the statistics of the quantum eigenvalues, uh, the Barry Tabor conjecture and the Bohiga Stanoni Schmidt conjecture. So some of you probably know that very well, but I did want to repeat that. So the idea is that in classically regular systems, um, the, the quantum eigenfunctions, if you look at their correlation to each other, and the thing you typically look at is the level spacings, it's so-called. So you look at all the eigenvalues, you put them into, you sort them, and you look at the distances between nearest neighbors. And the statistics of that happens to be universal for chaotic or regular quantum systems, typically, after you've done some magic to it. I don't want to go into the details there. So the idea is that for regular systems, they tend to be a Poissonian distribution, whereas for systems that are chaotic, they follow the same statistics as the eigenvalues of Hermitian random matrices. And in particular, there are three different types of Gaussian random matrices that you can use depending on symmetry properties of your quantum system. So this is what happens in Hermitian systems. And I flag up an example here for the kick top. The kick top is one of the cases which is faithful to this random matrix statistics. Not all quantum chaotic systems 
do that. Sometimes there are special circumstances that mean that just egg value statistics will actually not look like this. But the kick top is known to be one that that's for that but for which that works really really well. And here's an example of the um, numerically obtained eigenvalue level spacings in the regular regime, which follows this black curve, which is the Poisson one, and here in the chaotic regime, so where the histogram is really well described by this Gaussian random matrix statistics. Right, so let's move on to a PT symmetric kick top before my time is up. So let's introduce a PT symmetric version of this, and uh, I'm doing that me? in yeah. this. Uh, sorry uh, to interrupt. So the level statistics you showed, is it for the Fluke Hamiltonian or uh, how do you uh, get them? So it's for the quasi energy. So it's for the Fluke. So you look at the eigenvalues of the Fluke operator okay. and then, okay. but, and they lie on the unit circle. And then I actually translate them into quasi energies first, but you don't necessarily have to do that. You could just look okay. at the angles and what they do. Okay. And yeah. you know, technically, you would think that that should be compared to the eigenvalues of a unitary matrix, and it yeah. should really. But for large n, for large matrix sizes, these statistics are the same for Hermitian and um, for the the eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices or the angles of the um, eigenvalues of unitary matrices. So okay. it's sort of the you, same thanks. symmetry Thank classes. Mm -hmm. No problem. So maybe I can actually ask. Um, the, the time, so I've, I didn't really look at the time when we started. So how much time do I have? Yeah, so uh, you have a good 10, 15 minutes. Okay, so I should go to the PT symmetric one though. Okay, so I'm looking at around here, yeah, 40. Good, so here's the PT symmetric version and I'm introducing that in a theorist way by just throwing in a complex parameter here, you know, why not? <laughs> so we can talk about that, whether that can be realized or not. I guess it can, in fact, in, in a system which I don't really have time to, to show the details here, but you can, if you want to, by all means, you can realize that in a lab, I'm pretty sure. So what I'm doing here is I just make the, the, the linear part here a complex Hamiltonian. If this epsilon here is zero, then this is actually a complex PT symmetric Hamiltonian. And as such, the eigenvalues come in are either real or come in complex conjugate pairs. And this PT operator here is just an action on LX, LY, and LZ. Okay. And P squares to one and T is I to minus I, basically. Right. Um, the Floquet operator for that. Now we're doing that in a slightly um, complicated way. That's just because we want the Floquet operator to be PT symmetric with the same P and T. And for that, if you if you think about your physical process of going from one kick until the next kick, or until just after the next kick, then this isn't symmetric in time. So if you really want it to be PT symmetric with the same, with respect to the same PT operator, then you need to shift your time window to between the two kicks. So what we're looking at is we're doing half a free evolution then we do the kick and then half a free evolution, right? But you could do, you could look at just the free evolution and the kick or the kick and the free evolution. The information you get is kind of the same. It's just looking at different sections in time, but the Poincaré sections will look different, but they'll be related to each other. So it wouldn't be like looking chaotic in, in one of these time intervals, but not in the other. As long as you're looking over the whole period, they all carry the same information. So. This here is also PT symmetric. I just sort of flash up what that means for time evolution operator. It looks a little bit different from the um, relation we usually use for Hamiltonians, but it really is what you would get if your time evolution operator is e to the minus i, some fictitious Hamiltonian, then this f here um, inherits this symmetry from h. And via the, the energies of a Hamiltonian Hamiltonian come either real or in complex conjugate pairs, the symmetry here means that they either lie on the unit circle or we have pairs of lambda and one over lambda conjugate. So one going in and one going out from the unit circle in pairs. But we're actually going to look into quasi energies, which are the logarithms, i times the logarithms of these. And there again, they are just either real or complex conjugate as we are familiar from in Hermitian, in 
PT symmetric systems. So the classical dynamics of that, we have to actually be thinking a little bit harder of what we mean with that and what we want to compare in sort of typical quantum chaos is really phase-based structures, Huzimi functions and all these. So we're not, what, what will not work for us is to just look at a complexified classical dynamics. We really need to see a classical dynamics that's a limit in some way of the quantum dynamics and quantum um, operators L, X, Y, Z, they're still Hermitian operators and they will have real expectation values with respect to the standard inner product. And what we're looking at is the dynamics of these expectation values in this classical limit. You could say, again, that's the limit where you neglect quantum fluctuation and sort of quantum optics way of phrasing this. And the nice thing is, so you can do that if you want to do that mathematically, you can use, for example, a coherent state approximation. Um, the nice thing is that the kick we're using is actually Hermitian. So that isn't actually changed at all by our non-Hermitian bit, whereas the free evolution is linear and that we don't need to do any approximation. We can actually reduce the equations of motion for Lx, Ly, Z exactly. And for example, we can use a two-by-two two representation to do that or just ideas like Baker, Campbell, Hausdorff. Um, so doing that, we find the classical PT symmetric kick top, which I just want to show you briefly. So the non-hemission part of that is this free motion. It's not the kicking part. The kicking part is still just the torsion around the z-axis. So um, the free evolution here, that what I plot here is the actual continuous evolution. It's not a Poincaré plot of what this um, P L X minus i gamma z or plus i gamma z would look like. So you see if gamma is actually smaller than p, then these phase-based trajectories don't actually look non-Hermitian in, in a sense. They look Hamiltonian, but they're not. It's a not non-Hamiltonian flow, but there are no sinks or sources. And that's actually what's known in dynamical systems under the name of reversible dynamical systems. It's exactly dynamical systems that have a PT symmetry as we call it in quantum mechanics. Um, whereas if gamma is larger than P, then such a system would actually have maybe a classical PT symmetry breaking where we have sinks and sources in the dynamics. Whereas if we had a system which wasn't PT symmetric to start with, then you always have a sink and a source and you never have these sort of unbroken PT symmetric regions here. So we can then make a classical map out of our quantum evolution. I just flesh that up to demonstrate to you that you can have a more or less closed form expression for that, but it's lengthy. But you can just type that in and then you can evolve your classical evolution, your classical dynamics. And if you do that, you can generate Poincaré plots. And here are some examples in the not so chaotic regime. If gamma is zero, this looks all regular. If you switch on this non hematicity or PT parameter gamma, you see that the chaos becomes a bit more, but it's still of that type of this reversible type that there um, aren't really any sinks or sources in your system. It looks almost, if you just look at this, you could imagine it's a Hamiltonian system. And I think that has to do with, you know, what we like to think of in PT symmetry, that if it all the eigenvalues are real, there's some sort of equivalent Hamiltonian uh, Hermitian system out there. And you can kind of see this idea in the, in the classical dynamics that the classical dynamics looks almost like that of a Hermitian system or Hamiltonian system. For the chaotic regime, you know, where there's more chaos, we kind of observe the same thing. If we've put on the gamma, there's more chaos here. And you know, the, the symmetry in, in this sort of direction here gets um, less. And eventually we'll have um, sinks and sources in our dynamics. So here's an example up here where all the dynamics goes into this point and down. In the lower panels here, I show you what happens if you to a uniform distribution of points over the whole of phase space after a number of propagations, um, where at some point almost everything ends up in this sink of the dynamics. But there's a regular island here. So what was in here to start with just stays in there. So this here is just a magnification of, of this small region in that. Right, so there is something like a PT symmetry breaking classically in that system as well. 
Right, and then if we have a very large K, we actually get something that's not just associated to PT symmetry, but that's well known from classical um, non-Hamiltonian chaos, which is um, a strange attractor, or at least we think it is a strange attractor. It looks strange enough, and it's an attractor. <laughs> it does have a fractal structure and all the sort of, oh, it looks like having a fractal structure. So you seem to get these sort of things. And I flagged up earlier, I don't want to go all the way back, but you can see in here that you kind of see the symmetry line I've been showing you of the classical system. So these sort of swirls on here, they're really a fingerprint of some symmetry that's already in the system when, um, when it's not open, when it's not PT symmetric, but Hermitian. Right, so let's move on to quantum dynamics and see what we can see um, as fingerprints of this classical system. So first, I want to show you just some pictures of how the eigenvalues look for some examples. So here I have a 400 by 400 matrix. And I have to say, I have to keep the gamma very small in the quantum side, because otherwise these matrices have so many exceptional points. And um, some of them are so highly degenerate that the matrices are just numerically unstable, or not just numerically, <laughs> they're spectrally unstable. Um, so you can't really get reliable eigenvalues if gamma is too large or if you have any decent matrix size. So you have a small gamma, but luckily there's a lot happening in there anyway. So in the regular case, what happens is that the eigenvalues go off the real axis, but they, um, what's actually the difference between these pictures? Yeah, so the gamma is a bit larger here. So the eigenvalues gradually come into the complex plane, but they sort of do so on, on regular looking structures. Whereas in the chaotic case, if that was chaotic to start with, I have a much smaller gamma and the eigenvalues already become complex and they're basically all over the place. So I don't know whether this is always the case for chaotic PT symmetric systems or not. It, it looks, we've looked into a kicked rotor as well and it looks a little bit different there. So it might be a coincidence, it might just have to do with the kick top. But it's sort of quite a visual difference between a regular and a chaotic regime for this particular system when you make it PT symmetric. So what you can look at are these Huzimi structures, for example. And in the regular case, again, you just look at some of these eigenstates and they seem to be localizing on classical structures of the Poincaré section. Whereas if things are quite open, uh, quite chaotic, then actually what you see rather than the, well, you see the Poincaré section somehow, but what you're really seeing is related to the classical norm. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just showing you lots of ideas. I'm not going into any details here. So it turns out that the quantum system has the, the eigen, um, the quantum state has a norm that changes in time in a non-emission system. And even in a PT symmetric system, obviously particular, if you have complex eigenvalues, some of them will, states will, will grow in time and others will go down in time, but the classical limit of that system also knows about the norm. It has a classical variable, which is the norm, which I do go back very quickly. <laughs> I'm just going to flag it up. So which actually entered here, I didn't really point it out very much, but this gamma here is reflects the classical intensity, so to say, over time, which doesn't stay constant in such a non-emission system either. So you can look at the norm as a function of time. And I plotted that here in the classical system. And if you compare that to Huzimi functions, and um, there's a lot of stuff in here, what we're actually looking at is not an individual eigenfunction, but orthogonalized um, basis states of the subspace of all the growing eigenfunctions. And we plot that here. And you see that it agrees really, really nicely with this classical norm structure. I should almost finish, but now I'm coming to this sort of, sort of work in progress idea. So it might be a good point where um, they, I want to show you that or tell you that this doesn't always work. You know, this isn't always so nice. It works really nicely when things are very much dominated by this grow and so on. And we've been looking into with my student Joe of what, you know, what other phase space structures correspond to this quantum and classical correspondence. And, um, we've been studying that for a different system, which, as I said, I decided not to actually introduce in great detail, but it's a version of a PT symmetric kicked rotor. 
which is another standard example of quantum chaos. And I just flag up an example here where on the one hand, we have these Husimi functions of the growing states. And on the other side, we have this classical norm. That's the two things that match so nicely in this case here. And here they don't actually match at all. I mean, if you have a lot of fantasy, you can probably see this, but it's sort of turned around and it doesn't match very well at all. And there are examples of parameter cases where it doesn't match whatsoever. But what we've been coming up with is that there is actually something that you can use to make that match. And that's what we call privileged trajectories. And it's a work in progress where you actually sort the classical trajectories. You take the whole trajectory, not just the initial state or something, according to the average norm. And here on that side, I show a plot of all the trajectories whose norm classically grow. And you can see how they're much denser here in exactly the structure on which the quantum growing states live. And that actually, so far we've tested it in a lot of examples and in a lot of things, and it seems to really always work. So, um, but this is still work in progress. We're polishing that up, so watch that space. It's going to hopefully be published in one form or another sometime soon. So do I have a couple of minutes to show you some pictures on the spectral stats? Uh, two minutes. Good, perfect. So that's all I need. So um, the other thing were the spectral statistics, and there are two things we could be looking at. We could be looking into the nearest neighbor statistics in the complex plane. We have complex eigenvalues now. And that's what we did initially for the paper. And the expectation there would be that for an open chaotic system, that this the level spacings um, look like a two-dimensional Poisson distribution, which coincidentally looks like a one-dimensional chaotic one, that, that's a coincidence, when they're regular and they look like a com what's called the complex Geneva ensemble when they're chaotic. Um, it turns out, so we've done that for our kick top and it turns out that um, for the regular one, they're indeed, what am I doing? I think this is the, the, the color code is the wrong way around. I thought I fixed that earlier, but I must have fixed it the wrong way around. <laughs> so the green one here is the Poisson one, and this um, pink one here is what, this AI dagger. Yeah, I thought I fixed that, but I fixed it. It was right before, and now I <laughs> fixed it the wrong way around. Sorry. So the green one here is the what we expect from a regular, and the regular one they really do look like that, and um, the pink one is this AI dagger. Um, but it's not the Geneva one. So I'm sorry, some of you who haven't been thinking about that are probably a bit lost by now. So what I'm trying to say is that there's a huge difference between the level spacing statistics in the complex plane between regular and chaotic. And for the regular one, it looks indeed like one would expect it to look like independent random numbers in the complex plane. For the chaotic one, it looks like not like the complex Geneva, which had been assumed initially, but there is actually another symmetry in our system, which has been recently by Hamazaki et al. been called the AI dagger class. And basically these are just matrices that are um, the same as their transpose, which for a non-hermitian matrix is of course a separate sort of thing. And our system does have that symmetry and that's how it looks like. Exactly. You can also look at the real eigenvalues, and this is my very last slide. And if you do that, because that's something, you know, these class of systems, for example, both of these, they don't even have real eigenvalues. They're just standard complex random matrix ensembles. They're not PT symmetric and they don't, they don't have real eigenvalues, but a PT symmetric system has this property of having a lot of real eigenvalues often. Not always a lot, but it does have real ones. And what about their statistics? So now this is complete work in progress, but I did want to flag it up. For the kick top, I took a number of realizations and here I show you the count of real eigenvalues of these. So I made the matrix size a thousand by a thousand. And this is sort of the distribution of the number of real eigenvalues I got for these parameters that I looked at. And it's somewhere, the average is around 250. And here I show you the histogram of the eigenvalue, the level spacings of the real eigenvalues compared to what you would expect for the unbroken PT symmetry case when all of them are real, which is the 
the standard emission one. And in pink, I put in what you would get from a real Geneva ensemble, which is a PT symmetric random matrix ensemble. And it does sort of look sort of similar, but I'm not sure about the details. I mean, you can see that, that they are removed from each other and could be, it could be that, it could be any other PT symmetric random matrix model, maybe one of the ones that um, Joshua had been talking about. This is sort of, as I said, work in progress, but clearly there's a huge difference between this and the standard Hermitian level spacing, if not all of the eigenvalues are real. And with that, I think I should finish and summarize. So I just introduced to you, that's just my overview slide again. I just introduced to you the standard kick top to highlight some sort of features of quantum chaos, quantum classical correspondence that we're looking for in PT symmetric models. Then I introduced this one particular example system of a PT symmetric kick top which has interesting classical dynamics with you know, unbroken and broken PT symmetry. And then on the quantum side, we looked at eigenvalue statistics and Husimi distributions, and also this sort of new idea of privileged trajectories to try to find out how they all link in together. And there's a lot more to do. As you can see, there are more questions than answers, but a lot of colorful pictures. And with that, if you do want to know more, you can have a look at the paper on the kick top. And other than that, I thank you for your attention and do stay safe. Thank you so much, Eva, for this wonderful talk. Um, okay, I have a quick question actually. So uh -huh. uh, in the last part of your talk, when you spoke about these um, complex eigenvalues and the yep. statistics of that, right? Uh, there are these recent works about these complex spacing ratios, which takes into yes. account the distance in the complex plane. Yes. Uh, seems to me, is that exactly what you were looking at? Were you just looking at the radial no. distribution uh, of that? No. No, we were looking, oops. Um, so what was the say? I mean, we, we were just looking at the what, what had been done in the past, which is, it is a version of that. It's like the averaged version. So we are only looking at the actual distance in the complex plane without the angle resolution. You're just looking, I so what, what I Posen and Ackermann and others yeah. have been doing, um, they have, and we, we should study that for that, but um, so they have been looking at the angle resolution of Absolutely. where the nearest mm -hmm. neighbors are. So we're we only looking at how far away they are. The point that we haven't done it is really that I don't have any doubt that it will be the same as what they get for, sure. the, for the Geneva ensembles because they sure. have been showing that it's the same for all three Genebras and it's pretty universal. Yeah. So um, it's sort of on our list. We haven't done it yet, um, but I'm pretty sure. So basically also they have made the point that, you know, PT symmetry, for example, I don't think they explicitly mention it in there, but they're making the point that, for example, the real and the complex Genebra um, look the same in that. And that's because even so the real Genebra, as I said, is even PT symmetric. It has this symmetry, you know, they, they, they come in pairs and stuff and they have real right. eigenvalues. But this is sort of a global symmetry and, and the, the, these statistics you're looking at there, they're very local and they don't actually even care about this, you know, about sure. the big picture yeah. of what happens on the other sure. side. So I'm pretty sure, you know, um, this what we're doing here agrees with, with what they are finding, yep. but it's mm -hmm. only the, the radial part. Yeah, and it's it's not the, the radial part, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it seems that, I mean, if, if I try to understand the last part of your talk, uh, it seems that if I look at the phase space distributions where I would have classical correspondence, and mm -hmm. if I look at the, uh, the eigenvalue statistics, right? Mm -hmm. um, the phase space distribution seems to be, that there could be a mismatch between classical and quantum, but then you say that this can be sort of recovered by using these special trajectories, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, there isn't necessarily mismatch. It's just you don't quite know what the counterpart is. So on the classical side, you have lots of things to look at. You could look at the, the you know, That's just true. the Poincaré sections. And when you look at the Poincaré sections, then it's true that, for example, this regular and chaotic thing that matches with the spectrum and it, you know, it matches in that way. But now on the quantum side, what do you look at? And that's sort of where it actually, it's more the quantum side where it's a bit weird because you have all these eigenfunctions, but they're not orthogonal. And sometimes they all kind of look the same and they're just a blob sitting somewhere and 
you don't see any correspondence to the classical Poincaré section. Right. But then, you know, we've been thinking more about the norm because classically you also have the norm. You have regions of gain and loss and as the trajectory traverses, it grows and decays. And that actually has a lot to do with where the quantum eigenfunctions live. They, they tend to live on the spaces where classical dynamics would grow. Um, but that's also not the full story. And that's where you kind of need to be thinking of the trajectory together with its norm, which actually makes sense. It's sort of on the quantum side, it's like taking both the energy and the imaginary part, you know, the real and the imaginary part of yeah. the energy and putting them together. And the classical trajectories, if they're encoded with respect to their norm, they kind of know about that. Yeah. But again, if you only ask where does a single quantum eigenfunction live, you know, that's not that I don't actually know how to answer that one. I kind of know yeah. in the meantime, what are sort of quantum subspaces that correspond to certain classical structures. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, let's see if there are more questions from the audience. Okay, if not, let us thank our speaker, Eva Maria, 